Everything lights me on fire. Everything gets viewed through the prism of art. That kaleidoscope, you know? It's, it's all art to me. I was very fortunate, you know, I, started, I mean, like all kids, I started, you know, everybody draws, you know, but it, it wasn't, you know, for two hours, here's some entertainment, here's a coloring book, here's some crayons, you know, it was obsessive. The fortunate part was that I had parents that recognized there was something, you know, different going on with me, and so they put me in my first private lessons at the age of five. I was the art kid. I was the stone guy in a band in high school playing guitar. <laughs> I was not, the, not an athlete. I was the guy on the motorcycle. Ended up in art school. That was more for commercial art, you know, for graphic design and photography. I've been through through all the formal uh, and traditional training, you know, from like from still life to figurative to landscape, all those things. And I was working for a few years as an abstract expressionist. And at the time, I was also remodeling a mid-century modern home, one of the Mies van der Rohe beam and post kind of glass cube things uh, out in the woods. When you have a glass wall like this and a home like this, I mean, everything that happens outside happens inside. You know, it's instantaneous. You know, you're never unaware of what's going on. You know, and it's, you get these great, uh, you're in shadow one minute, and then the next second you get these floods of ethereal light running through these channels between the beams. I was just stunned by this space. And it kind of hit me one day, sitting in there in that house working, I thought, if you do this for 10 more years, abstract expressionism, you're gonna be really good abstract expressionist. And who gives a And that's when I started looking into and studying a little bit of modern architecture and got into the whole notion of space. This room exists because of these walls. This space exists because of the architecture. And then you can manipulate that architecture through texture and color and light and you know, repetition, all the, all the tricks of the trade that architects rely on to build a space like this. I started trying to incorporate in the paintings. At that point, I just realized, man, the door's been kicked wide open. This is the way to do it is just take, you know, pull from everything. So I started bringing that architecture in there, worked with it, practiced, made painting after painting, and then I started bringing other elements in, like pop art, writing and surrealism, abstract expressionism, music. A combination of all those things, that, that's, that's sort of become my voice now. When I start working on a painting, I'll just respond to it. There's no top, bottom, left or right. You don't need to worry about color, composition, just be free. You should get the, the Muse Asylum. This is something that started back in uh, 2004. It's a caged asylum for all my inspiration. <laughs> I just can't stop working on it. Things go into it every day. And my buddy Albert, his inspiration. I, I read a book at that time, and you know, because the doors were wide open, it was like, okay, well, this is an influence. And the book was Einstein's Dreams by Alan Lightman. The main theme running through the book was, or the one that resonated the most with me, was the idea that um, time was elliptical, that our lives are elliptical and they keep repeating themselves over and over and over, sometimes the same, sometimes slightly different based on our decisions, but that every moment of every life that everyone's lived exists somewhere in parallel space. I just took an abstract understanding or approach, you know, questioning to that and thought, well, what might that look like? This is the elegant universe. This is, uh, I think this is number one. There's four in the series, but this is a great example of the Einstein's dreams series and uh, that whole theory, that whole idea. This is, uh, you know, this is, this is, this is the work. This is the basis of my work. You know, this is the look, you know, and everything I'll use this style, you know, from here on out to comment on all the things that I want to comment on. When you talk about time being elliptical and our lives repeating themselves, that's one of the things I do with the imagery in my paintings. I will repeat them as a literal example of that theory through several bodies of work. Felix here is a good example. And then you come over here, and here he is again, you know, in another painting, in another composition, you know, with a different narrative and a whole different vibe, a whole different feeling, living its life again. I always said I have one rule in the studio is if you develop a rule to break it, but there's two rules. There's that rule. <laughs> and then there's one, one guiding rule over that that says, you know, when you finish this painting, you better not be able to solve it.
This is uh, where troubles melt like lemon drops. <laughs> it's the name of this painting. But this is a good example of how I work. I always start with a raw piece of canvas on the floor and, you know, dump my paints and get in here and work on my hands and knees. I write in it, I scratch through the paints. I silk screen images. I use a hammer. Get a close up of that. There's some there's some real beauty <laughs> happening right there. More accidental art. But uh you know, that's the therapeutic part of painting. Um using this, you know. <laughs> oh, was that loud? This was my first hammer piece. Do you do drugs, Danny? Smart boy. I was uh quoting the great philosopher Ty Webb from Caddyshack. <laughs> this piece was created under duress <laughs> for the Bravo Network. Uh, I flew out to uh, LA last summer um, for an open casting call for uh, the Untitled Artist Project, uh, which is kind of kind of be like Project Runway but with artists. They gave us an assignment to create a piece in the current style that we were working in, and we had to incorporate one of three themes that they had on a sheet of paper, which one was the use of a hammer. Um, the other one was Vice, that's where the title came from. I was talking to somebody recently who was saying the one thing that you can't stand when you're an artist. We have a new couch, and could you paint something that goes with our couch? And so, <laughs> the statement I have on here is, uh, in art, nothing spiritually profound comes from the consciousness. Intellect, yes, but without Without the mystery of the subconscious, art risks becoming merely decoration. While we're on the subject, f your couch. <laughs> I don't know if you can use that, but <laughs> you should know that that's what it says. <laughs> you go, if you know who you are out there, you made it onto the painting. This piece, this is uh, the day William de Kooning died, part one. There's it's a diptych. There's two of them. It's an homage to uh, to William de Kooning, one of my favorite artists, and. Uh, I was reading his biography at the time, you know, and it was, it was a little sad at the end, you know, because he kind of lost his mind a little bit, but he could still create, you know, beautiful works of art. And the day William de Kooning died, it was March, uh, March 19th, 1987, if I remember correctly. And it was early spring, so the colors were inspired by the spring thaw. I like this image of William riding his bike. He looked happy. And <laughs> the grid that's over top of here, the graphic elements on here, uh, is based on the New York Times crossword puzzle um, from that day that he died. So there's a whole subcontext to this painting. Um, if you want to look it up, you can uh, kind of just get a feel for what happened that day, the day that he died. I'm not working in a chosen or established genre. I'm trying to create one. I want it to be a living, breathing, energy-filled thing. You know, I want it to be engaging. I, I want it to never be solved. These are open-ended questions. I'm holding up a mirror, saying this is what I see. What do you see? 